Go ask your brother. Hey YouTube, welcome back to another video on external instruments. And we're up to 110 subscribers now, which is really cool. I started doing this for my brother in Milwaukee years ago, and, and now there's a whole bunch of folks following it, which is awesome. And I realize 110 isn't a whole lot by YouTube standards, but it's a bunch for me and I appreciate you. Uh, the video on external instruments has gotten a heck of a lot more traffic than I would have imagined. And one question that has, has rolled in repeatedly is, can you show me how your stuff is set up? Because I want to do this at home. And um, alert reader Chen Yu, I think I'm saying that right, um, just sent a question in along those lines uh, last night. And I thought, you know what, this is as good a time as any just to, to run through this in let's, real time. Let's do big picture before detail. Remember the fundamental idea in using an external instrument in Cubase is that you're going to send uh, MIDI data out from Cubase, and that's going to trigger a hardware device and squirt audio information back in. So you've got a MIDI out, audio in sort of relationship going on here. And second, put the breaks on this for just a moment. Remember, if, if you just want to record an external synthesizer, you don't have to go through all of this to do it. You can just simply plug the audio outputs from your synth or whatever you have in, in like you would a microphone or anything else. Just plug it into your interface and, and roll and just do it as an audio track. You don't have the luxury of the uh, MIDI editing afterwards and so forth, and it, it won't pop up in the menus and things. But if you just need to, uh, to record a synthesizer, you, you don't need to do this at all. You just treat it like it was a uh, a non-MIDI device or a, an acoustic piano or something, basically. Now, I would say the uh, the other thing to keep in mind if you want to do this, to do it elegantly, you need a lot of inputs and outputs. The days of the big mixing board are gone, at least here, as much as I would love to have one because they're cool. Um, what we've invested in instead is, is audio inputs and outputs in the rack and do all the mixing inside of Cubase. And then uh, the last thing I would say is that when you're doing the setup, um, it, it takes a little bit of attention to detail and some care to make it work, to get it set up right so that it works elegantly and easily in the future. So I have an empty Cubase project here. I'm going to right click and add an instrument track. And you know what? I'm not going to do that yet. Let's start with, uh, let's again keep working from big picture to small picture. Let's go to the device setup menu first. And Chen Yu, this is basically to answer your, your primary question. How is everything connected? So what we're looking at here is um, we have an MR816 audio interface over here and a Presonus light pipe. It's um, a Digimax LT is the actual model number. And so the, 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 the um, Steinberg unit has eight physical inputs on it. And then it can be daisy chained to this light pipe, which gets you another eight physical inputs. And I could use another 16 today. But you'll see here that the first two are dedicated to um, booth microphones. And then you can follow down the yellow, what each of the physical, the, in the yellow here, describes the physical input on the hardware device. And then over to the right, um, I've gone in and, and named these based on what I've plugged into it. Then, um, as you can see, the outputs are, are largely unused in this particular rig because we're not doing a whole lot of beyond just stereo monitoring. So the first question is how everything is connected. That's, that's sort of the first step. Then after that's done, let's go into Devices and VST connections. Come over to the fourth tab, external instruments, and take a look there. I've got, in this project, I've only got the three active, the Roland, the Yamaha, and the Korg. And you can see that those device ports, the yellow ones, same ones we we're looking at in the other screen, are now referenced here. If you were to go back and change its name there, it would change here and so forth. Uh, let's go back to inputs for just a second, though. I want to show you something. If um, and here I just have the two mono inputs for the two booth mics. If I go to add a, another bus, my choices for uh, inputs are now limited. And the ones in red um, can't be used because they're dedicated to these external instruments. So Actually, let me, let me do this. Let me say if I went in here and said, no, I want to use that one, it's going to come up and say, that port is used exclusively. Do you really want to keep going with this? And you can say yes, and it will connect it to that. But now... Now I've just messed with my uh, my ex my Korg rig in the background. I have to go back and put that back later to use it for its intended purpose. Okay, so now let's create that instrument track. And the uh, external stuff, once you've got it configured per the other video, it's going to pop up here, um, not, under, not under synths, but it's going to come up under its own menu, the external uh, plugins. And you can see here's the, the Roland, the Korg, and the Yamaha. Now let me go put this Roland device into the project. 
right there, and we should hear a clav sound. Okay. Um, now let's do that again, add instrument track, and you'll notice the chord's no longer available there. That external instrument can only work on one track at a time now, so it takes it away from the menu. And this was a question that had come up a couple of weeks ago, that uh, what, what if I want to use my, my little Roland uh, synth here on nine tracks? Uh, you could do that. It would be cumbersome. You would have to go through and essentially uh, create the MIDI you know, performance and then capture that as an audio track then reassign it and and keep going like that if that makes sense uh, and that's just another one of the limitations of external plugins so or external instruments sorry um, then the last thing that i would say here is that the midi setup behind all this is deceptively simple um, because again we're we looked at a lot at the audio routing if we go up to um, device setup in midi there's, there's not much here. I've got an in and out to my uh, control surface, the CC121, which is really cool, by the way. If you don't have one, you should. They rock. And then this little tiny USB uh, Uno MIDI interface. It's just a dongle thing in the back. But it feeds uh, a MIDI router in the rack, and that's where the, the magic happens. So as far as Cubase knows, there's just the one MIDI output, one MIDI input for musical data. But what you can't see on here is that the router then splits off and touches all, I don't know, eight, ten synths, whatever we have out here. Uh, and that kind of brings me to my last set of uh, tips and tricks here, if you will, or recommendations if you're going to do this, especially if you're going to do more than one external device. Uh, remember that as soon as you're out of the computer, you're out into the hardware world, um, you're dealing with older generation technology. So things like MIDI channels now count. So when you're, when you're troubleshooting, you set this all up and it doesn't work, <laughs> which is going to be the case the first few times because there's so many variables. Um, I would recommend that you think in terms of data, signal, and power, or probably power, signal, and data in that order. I mean, the first question is, is it plugged in and turned on? And I can't tell you how many times I've made that very mistake because the way this is set up, my controller keyboard has to, the MIDI data has to flow through the, the Korg to get into the rest of the system. So if this keyboard, which I very rarely play, isn't turned on, it won't pass the MIDI data through. And I've sat here for 20 minutes trying to figure out what routing issue I've got. And it's, oh, <laughs> turn on the keyboard. Uh, and then start thinking signal. So just take a pair of headphones and put it into your hardware device and play it, if it has keys, and ascertain that it's making sound first. We've had that too. You're trying all sorts of stuff and it just won't come through. Oh, so the volume's turned down or got bumped. Um, and then, and I guess that's same for the, are all the cords connected? And then the last would be is the MIDI data making it through on the right channel being routed to everything. Is the external instrument on the same channel as the, is this thing here inside Cubase, you have this on the same channel as the, the physical setting on the outside uh, box. And so to help facilitate those or to eliminate some of that, uh, some of those headaches, a couple of things I would recommend colored patch cords. Uh, if you go to Guitar Center or your local store or whatever, you should be able to get a bag of the patch cords in uh, all different colors. When you're turned around backwards looking at a rack with 32 cords there trying to figure out what box is connected to what instrument and what interface input and you're working with a mag light in your teeth, um, if they're all black cords, it's just uh, real paint. So uh, brightly colored rainbow cords in the back of the rack can make all the difference. The uh, second thing I would recommend is um, and again, this only applies if you have multiple devices, but I would put the MIDI channel for each device. I would, I would leave them alone. I'd set them up, you know, channel one, two, three, four, five, whatever it is, and I'd put that sticker on the front of each one uh, so that you don't have to get into your MIDI router. And it's like programming a digital watch, you know, to figure out, set that up one time and just be done with it. And if you leave those MIDI channels on the front and leave them alone, um, it'll go a lot smoother. And the third, pencil. Take very good notes and remember where you put them um, as you go along because that's key to everything is there's so many different moving pieces in a setup like this that uh, it, you can't realistically remember them all in real time. And remember to update those notes. And I'll tell you, I'll leave you with one funny story and hopefully if it's funny enough, you'll, you'll remember it. Um, years ago, uh, I was going to do a little electrical wiring in one of our daughter's rooms. So I went to the master fuse box and I turned off the main power for Laura's room. And, uh, and 
didn't turn off Courtney's room or anybody else's. Went into Laura's room and opened up the switch plate and almost electrocuted myself <laughs> because I'd forgotten that I put those labels up five years ago and last summer the girls changed rooms. <laughs> so Laura's room was no longer Laura's room. And uh, the exact same thing will happen with your setup, especially if you're moving stuff in and out, moving cords around and changing things. Keep your, uh, keep your drawing of how everything's put together um, uh, current and it'll save a lot of headaches and, and expedite your troubleshooting and stuff. So uh, more talking than demoing on this one, but I hope that helps. I'll go ahead and put uh, screenshots of the VST connections and the uh, device set up in the comments section to look at. I hope this helps. And if you guys have any other questions or ideas for other videos, let me know and we'll roll them out to you. Thanks a whole lot for watching. Talk to you again real soon. Bye.